everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach. This time I wanted to focus on standard deviation and error bars. This is specifically targeted towards the BTEC Applied Science Unit 3, but you might find it useful if you're doing A-level biology or any sort of statistical topic where you need to talk about what standard deviation is and actually what the function of error bars are on a graph. So when we're talking about standard deviation, we're really just saying that it's a measure of how spread out the numbers are in your sample. Now, normally when we've got a sample, we work out the average or the mean, but the averages don't tell us anything about the actual sample. So for example, the sample can be very uniform with all the data all bunched up around the mean, or they can be spread out a really long way from the mean. And so the standard deviation is basically a statistic that measures the spread and what we normally say is that the wider the spread of scores, the larger the standard deviation. But quite often, the larger the standard deviation, the less reliable the results are. So it's normally calculated by using this sort of um, equation. And we normally have to plug in a series of numbers. Now, I usually recommend to my students to create an Excel spreadsheet, a Google Sheets, or a table of some form where you can manually write down each of the equations so that you can identify anywhere where you've made a mistake and you're less likely to make mistakes in the long term because there is an awful lot of calculations that you've got to do. So let's just say, for example, this is our data set and I've just picked a series of numbers out of thin air, literally, just to make it quite simple for you to understand what you need to do. So if I've got the numbers 9, 2, 5, 4, 12, 7, 8 and 11, these might be, for example, shoe sizes or they could be they could be anything. Just imagine them to be a part of your data. In order to work out the standard deviation, the first thing we need to do is work out the mean. And the mean is represented by this sign over here. This is just the simple average of all of the numbers. So you simply add them together, divide them by the number of numbers there are. So in this case, there's eight, and that would give you your mean. Then for each of the numbers, you've got to subtract the mean and square the result. So that would give you this middle part of that particular equation. After that, you can work out the mean of those squared differences, and then you can take the square root of that, and then you're done. So you kind of think, okay, well, there's four steps. It still looks quite complex. The best way is really just to work it out with this data. So let's have a go at doing that. So what I've done here is exactly what I would tell my students to do. Log their data on a table and do it step by step so you're less likely to make mistakes. So I've got the data 9, 2, 5, 4, 12, 7, 8 and 11. I haven't put them in, in a chronological order. I've just left them as it is. So the first thing I've done is I've worked out the mean that you can see in the blue there. So I've added them all together and I've divided them by eight because my sample size is eight. And so I've got 7.25 as my mean. The next step I need to do is work out what my data number would be minus the average. So for the first digit that you see there of 1.75, in order to work that out, all I've done is go 9 minus 7.25 and I get 1.75. Then it would be 2 minus 7.25 and I get minus 5.25. Then I do 4 minus 7.25 and I get minus 3.25 and I keep on going until I've looked at all of those numbers and I've got a figure in each of those cells. The next step is to square all those numbers that you see in the purple. And this basically eliminates those minus numbers that you had in the previous column. And after I've done the squares of each of those data points, I would simply add them all together and I would get the sum. And this completes that kind of top part of the standard deviation method, which looks at that kind of sum of symbol. After I've done that particular step, I'm really looking at how to work out the variance. So in order to work out the variance, I have to do one divided by the sample size. In this case, the sample size is eight. So I do one divided by eight and I multiply that by the sum of what I've just worked out in the previous step. So if I do one divided by eight multiplied by 83.5, I get 10.44. And this is my figure for the variance. And then all I've got to do is work out the square root of my variance. And that would be the square root of 10.44, which gives me the standard deviation of 3.23. Now, I've done all of this manually and I've checked it all on an Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet. 
So when you come to this, you would have to do this manually. And I'll, I'll give you an example of an exam question in a second. But if you're doing this for, say, for example, unit six, where you've got to do an investigative project or any other experiment that you might have where you've got to work out the standard deviation, it's really, really easy to do on an Excel spreadsheet. So please make sure that you use that to eliminate any mistakes at all. Obviously, in the exam, you will have to know which numbers to plug in where, which is the next step that I'm going to show you. So this particular practice question is taken directly from the exam, and it shows a experiment that was carried out looking at soil from three different areas, small inner city nature reserve. And um, the colleague, whoever's done this practical, has planted three cell seeds, sorry, the colleague has planted three seeds in each of the soil samples and they've taken three tests of three areas. So you can see there you've got test one, test two, test three, and then you've got the mean. The first part of the question asks you to calculate the mean for area number two and you've got to show you're working. So this is quite easy. What you need to do is you need to go 22 plus 24 plus 26 and you divide that by three and you should get 24 as the mean. The next part of the question actually asks you to calculate the standard deviation for area number two. Now, this time you will see that the equation for standard deviation is slightly different. So I just want to show you how this might vary. The first part of it is showing you the X and the X bar. So the X is known as the data point and the X bar is the mean. N in this particular case is the sample size. So our sample size here is three. And so n minus one would be two. And we'll come on to why that's important in a second. So the first thing I've done over here is just put my data into a table again. I've put down what my x values are, which is 22, 24, and 26. I know that those are my x values because the question says for area two only. So that's how I've been able to create the table. The next value I've put in is x minus x bar, which is basically my data point minus the average. So 22 minus 24 is minus 2. 24 minus 24 is 0, and 26 minus 24 is 2. The next step is to square them. So I've gone minus 2 squared is 4, 0 squared is 0, 2 squared is 4. And then I've added those sums of the squares together, so I've got 8. The next step that I need to do is divide that sum of 8 divide that by n minus 1. So our n equals 3, n minus 1 will be 2. And so I do 8 divided by 2, and I get 4. So that's all of that is basically just plugging it right into the standard deviation equation. Once I've got that 4, all I've got to do is do a square root of it. And therefore, the standard deviation answer is 2. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of the application of it. Now, to develop this a little bit is when we have to talk about standard deviation error bars. Now, you might be thinking, well, what on earth is an error bar? And it's kind of what you see here. I discussed it in one of my previous videos as well. So you can look at that and understand how you can plot error bars as well. Now, an error bar is basically just a line through a point on a graph, and that's parallel to one of the axes, which represents the uncertainty or the variation of the coordinate of that particular point. So, for example, these error bars are vertical, and what they're showing you is the variance between the average temperature rise in all of those carbohydrates foods. I should mention that this is taken directly from an exam as well. So this is exactly what you'd be expected to do in the exam should a question like this come up. Now, you might also be thinking, well, what's the point in these error bars? Why should I include them at all? Well, error bars are really good at communicating information about your data. So, for example, they can show you how spread the data are around the mean value. If you've got a small error bar, it basically means you've got a smaller standard deviation, and that means a low spread. In basic English, that basically just means that data is clumped around the mean. A larger standard deviation bar means a larger spread, and that basically means that data is more variable from the mean. So you can see the difference between marshmallows and pop popcorn. The standard deviation for marshmallows will be much, much smaller than the popped popcorn standard deviation. Error bars will also allow you to check the reliability of the mean value as a representative number for that data set. So again, in other words, all that basically means is how accurately does your mean value that you've calculated represent the data? Again, the smaller the standard deviation bar, the more reliable the data is. The larger the standard deviation bar, the less reliable it is. 
It's really important to note that just because you've got a large standard deviation doesn't indicate that your data is not valid. It basically just means that your results or your biological measurements are just variable. That's all that is. And then the last thing that the error bars can show you is whether there is a likelihood of there being a significant difference between data sets. And this is the bit that I wanted to explain in a bit more detail. So you're probably thinking, OK, I don't really get it. I don't get how error bars can indicate statistical significance. Well, all we're talking about with a significant difference or statistical significant difference means that the results that are seen are most likely not due to chance or sampling error. So in any experiment or any observation that you carry out that involves sampling from a population, there's always a possibility that anything you observe in that sampling process could have occurred due to sampling error alone. But if the result is significant, then you as an experimenter may conclude that the observed effect actually reflects the characteristics of that population rather than the sampling error or chance. So the standard deviation bars on a graph can be used to get a sense of whether or not the difference is significant. The first thing you need to really do is look for overlap. So what I've done here is I've drawn a little box showing the overlap between the standard deviation bars of maize puffs and popped popcorn. You will see there is no overlap between the maize puffs and the marshmallows. You will also see that there is an overlap between the rice cakes and the popped popcorn. But if we look at the size of the overlap, hopefully you can understand that the overlap between the rice cakes and the popped popcorn is much larger than the overlap between the popcorn and the maize puffs. And all of this is really important. So what you need to think about is whether there's overlap and make a comment on that. If there is less overlap and whether there's no overlap. So you must be thinking, OK, right, I've seen the bars, I can see there's an overlap, but what is it that I need to say? And this is quite key for answering questions in the exam. The first thing you need to consider is that when the standard deviation error bars overlap quite a bit, it's a clue to you that the difference between, for example, the popcorn and the rice cakes is not statistically significant. In order to actually say whether it's significant or not, you've got to perform a statistical test to draw a final conclusion. When the standard deviation error bars overlap even less, like between the popcorn and the maize puffs, it's a clue to you that the difference is probably not statistically significant. Again, in order to confirm that, you would need to perform a statistical test. And then finally, when the standard deviation error bars don't overlap at all, like in the case of maize puffs and marshmallows, marshmallows and the popcorn and marshmallows and the rice cakes, that's a clue to you that the difference may be significant, but you cannot be sure. In order to be sure, you have to perform a statistical test. So standard deviation itself is not a statistical test by itself. Rather, it's a measure of variability. To assess the statistical significance, you've got to take into account lots of different things, like, for example, sample size, what statistical test is suitable for your data, and so on. So therefore, while standard deviation error bars can give you a clue about its significance or insignificance, you have to still perform a test to talk about the final valid conclusions from data like this. So I hope that makes sense to you guys. If you need any more help on this, then feel free to comment underneath this video and I'd be happy to create resources or answer questions that you might have. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember this is suitable for Unit 3 and for Unit 6, perhaps on the BTEC Level 3 course. And it's also pretty good for any other biology where you've got to talk about standard deviation, means and error bars. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to share with anyone you think might find it useful. Bye for now.